Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. This is part two of the Ryzen 7 7700X build video series, the Y vlog. Do you want more detail than was in part one? Do you want a analysis of each part, the pros and cons of it, what alternative parts might be considered going up a step, down a step or to an alternative brand, such as AMD to Intel or Nvidia to AMD on the video card, then you are definitely in the right place. This will be much longer than the first video because it is unscripted. I am simply going to talk about each part in the build and share with you my experiences on testing all of this hardware. One of the benefits of being a YouTuber is you kind of get to play with everything and you start to see the differences and pros and cons of different levels of hardware. It is not all the same value just scaled up and down. There are distinct value points within any given product scale where this is a good deal, this isn't. This is a good deal and this isn't. And so that's what I'm going to share with all of you today. If you guys like this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. More than 50% of our views on YouTube are from non-subscribers. So if you get even five minutes into this video and you find it useful and helpful, smash that button. It is greatly appreciated and doesn't cost you a thing. Now, as I mentioned in the first video, there will be links down in the video description below to all of the products. This video, however, is not sponsored by Newegg, who sponsored our first video. So this video will have links to Amazon, Newegg, and eBay, as well as a couple of other stores as well down in the video description below. Those are affiliate links. Another great way to support us in these very long form videos is to use those links before you buy anything from those stores. Just click it, go shopping, check out. Doesn't cost you anything extra, but supports the channel and it is greatly, greatly appreciated. And without further ado, please grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's get into this. These long form detailed videos take a long time to film and a long time to edit. So please bear with me here while we try to pay the bills. And on top of that, an introduction to this video sponsor, URCD Keys. You're building a computer, you need a Windows key, either Windows 10 or Windows 11. I'll be back with you after this message. Buy Windows 10 Professional for $15, activate instantly online with Microsoft, and keep it forever. Don't pay full price, get the best deal from our sponsor, URCD Keys, using our link in the video description below. Full details on how this amazing deal works at the end of the video. Just like the first video, there will be timestamps down in the video description below, as well as there should be on the YouTube timeline, depending on which device you're watching this on. It is on the PC or Mac at least. I am going to talk about each component in sequence, CPU, motherboard, RAM, etc. And then again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'll talk about the various pros and cons going up, down, etc. And what the benefits and drawbacks from going with different choices are. I cannot possibly cover every single product on the market. And inevitably, whenever I make these kind of videos, I could have five or six different variations of a motherboard or a CPU cooler. And somebody in the comment says, yeah, but you didn't mention this or what about that? I understand. It's not possible to talk about every single variant of every single component. Now it's perfectly fine to ask those questions down in the video description below. It boosts engagement and it's appreciated. If I cannot answer you personally, well, maybe somebody else will answer you or you can always ask me over on Twitter or you could join our Patreon using the link down in the video description below and ask me there. I do make sure to reply to all of my Patreon messages. Our first component today are CPUs. And as you can see, I have a selection of six on the desk. Honestly, Intel and AMD frankly make too many different models of CPUs in my personal opinion. You need small, medium, and large, and maybe an extra large for the super duper enthusiasts. This is the Ryzen 7 7700X of which this system is based around. It is a great CPU, and as I mentioned in the first video, for pure gamers, for people who simply want 1440p, 100 plus frames per second, for the next X number of years, that's a great CPU. And because it's on AM5, it is upgradable to Zen 5. And that is where it is really interesting. It is in many regards weaker than the i5 13600K, that is similarly priced from Intel, very similar to the i5-13500 I have here. I don't have a retail box to that. However, it's upgradable, whereas the 13th gen really is not. Note, I am aware of the fact that there are rumors that 14th gen will also be on LGA-1700. That is a Raptor Lake refresh. The fact that it's 14th gen means nothing. There is no upgrade path to 13th gen. The true next gen chips will in fact be on a new socket. 
but we've got Zen 5 coming in 2024, and that is the single biggest reason that I'm no longer excited about the Ryzen 9s on Zen 4. Zen 5 is coming on the AM5 socket. That's not confusing, Zen 4 on AM5, regardless. So if you buy a 7950X3D, yes, it's amazing. Yes, it's fast. Yes, it's wonderful. It combines both productivity and incredible gaming performance with that 3D chip. You put an RTX 4090 on there, or maybe an RX 7900 XTX. It's amazing, but it will age poorly, relatively speaking, because when Zen 5 comes out, it's gonna be faster than everything on this desk. And that may be coming out in as little as a year, probably September or October of 2024, but it's getting pretty close to being just a year away. So my thought process with the 7700X is it's a placeholder until Zen 5 comes out. Wait until the best chip for AM5 comes out. Maybe that's Zen 5, probably Zen 6, probably three years from now in 2026. And at that point, go ahead and buy the best chip on the platform if you want to keep it for a while. In which case, if you go AM5, it's going to last you a long time. Whereas you'll have to completely replace the platform over on Intel. On the other hand, you could always just buy an i9-13900K and get 24 cores, 32 threads today and just not care for the next five or six years because that is truly an impressive CPU. Although so is that, and you could do the same thing and just keep it for the next five or six years and forget the whole upgrade nonsense. That's a personal preference. Several people in the comment section on the first video asked the question, what about the Ryzen 5 7600? Doesn't that make sense if it's a placeholder and Zen 5's coming in a year? Shouldn't you get the cheapest chip? My first thought was, no, that's six cores, that's ridiculous. Then I thought about it and I thought, hmm, that's not a bad idea actually. And I then looked at the non-X version of the 7600, $220. Okay, that's a reasonable discount. The 7600X is not. At the time I'm recording this video, the Ryzen 5 7600X is like $40 cheaper than the 7700X. Don't say $40 to not go, that doesn't make any sense. However, $80? Yeah, that might be worth it. The 7600 will still play most games. It will, however, be limited. There are games that use eight cores. I do think this is a better placeholder choice, but there's nothing wrong with a 7600 if you wanna go that route. Many of you may notice that I have the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D here on the desk. Yes, we've tested it. Yes, we have the benchmarks. No, we never did make a video about it because life got in the way and months passed and I never got around to it. I really should go ahead and make the video just to show the performance, but of course many videos on this exist today. I love the CPU, I don't love the price. If it was a little bit less expensive, I think it would be a phenomenal last chip upgrade for pure gamers on the AM4 platform. The Ryzen 7 5700X is really a better price to performance ratio chip, but there's nothing wrong with this as well. And I know a number of you have gone to it and they're like, man, it's awesome, it's great, it's wonderful. For pure gaming, it definitely is fast. It only makes sense, however, for owners of existing AM4 systems. If you're watching this going, well, instead of building this, should I really just go ahead and build an AM4 system? Why go with all this DDR5 nonsense? Here's the problem. At 1080p with an overpowered graphics card, the 5800X 3D, is in fact just as fast as the 7700X. Really, with a 3090 Ti at 1080p in competitive games, a 5800X 3D does keep up with Zen 4, but only in that scenario. Make them more graphics card limited, either increase the resolution or reduce the graphics card. We did try putting an RX 6700 on here. We kicked it up to 1440p and all those benefits just completely vanished. That 3D cache only really helps in CPU bound scenarios and only in games. When it comes to general Windows performance, productivity performance, multitasking performance, and gaming performance with both averages and 1% lows, where the graphics card is the primary limitation, meaning we're not running a 4090 at 1080p medium detail, which is silly. The 7700X is faster than the 5800X 3D. And at the moment, they both currently cost exactly the same money. Where the 5800X 3D makes sense is if you currently own an AM4 board and it's a drop-in replacement, in which case, absolutely go for it, extend your system for another, you know, one, two, three years, whatever it may be, and that's a good choice. But if you don't own it, AM4 is over. It is time to go to something newer. 
Unless, of course, you go truly budget if you get like a Ryzen 5 5600, but that is way outside the scope of this video. I mentioned Intel just a minute ago, very briefly. The 13900K is absolutely amazing and it's wonderful. And if you want to get it, sure, it is $550. You'll see here I have the box for the i7 13700K. It's $400. It's kind of a weird in-between option. Either get the i5 or get the i9. I'm honestly not a fan of this at 400. If it were 300, it would be slam dunk the winner. The i5 13600K is currently $299 as of the making of this video. For $300, a 14 core, 20 thread CPU that has single, port, single core performance that is ever so slightly faster than the 7700X and multi-core performance that outright demolishes it Really, honestly, there's no comparison here. An i5 13600K is the clear, absolute winner in all respects, except one. It has no upgrade path, and no an i9-13900K is not an upgrade path. If you want one, buy one today. It'll still cost you 200 bucks to upgrade in the future. It's silly. Buy it now if you want it. But this has potentially four, five years of upgrade path in front of it, and that's why I like it. I didn't like it at the $450 launch price, but at $300, I'm a fan. You'll also notice I have the box for the i5-13500. Now that is going to get a video all of its own, and it's complicated because that's not a Raptor Lake despite being 13th gen. It's actually an Alder Lake refresh. Only the 13600K and higher are actually Raptor Lake. Having said that, that is also 14 cores and 20 threads, but the i5-13400 is not. Do not be deceived. It's very confusing, and Intel should not have done this, and I'm very frustrated, but they did it. That is 10 cores. This is 14 cores. It's very annoying, but this is $250. It's 500 megahertz slower than the 13600K, and it's actually Alder Lake despite the 13 number. Spend the 50 bucks, get the 13600K. It's faster out of the box. It'll have better resale value, and it's the true next generation chip with lower internal latencies and some of the other optimizations that were made with Raptor Lake. Changing the order around from the original video just a bit, we're gonna leapfrog ahead to video cards because I suspect video cards is one of the most interested topics people have when they watch these kind of videos. I know there were a lot of comments about the video card choice in the first video. In the first video, we included the ASUS Tough Gaming RTX 4070 12 gigabyte graphics card for the low, low price of only $635. A lot of people had things to say about this. The 4070 is overpriced, it doesn't have enough VRAM, NVIDIA sucks. I understand. However, some of you may be surprised, it's kind of equal in performance to the RX 6800. Now wait, you say, the RX 6800 is $100 less. Generally, you can buy an RX 6800, again, at the time of filming, in the United States. I know prices vary around the world, but I'm only talking about US prices. You can buy one of these for $500 and it has 16 gigabytes of VRAM. Go figure. This is 600 plus dollars. You can find plenty for, for 600. This is 635. It has 12 gigs of VRAM, and in some games, it's slower, but in some games, it's faster. It depends on whether it's an NVIDIA-focused title or an AMD-focused title. However, the NVIDIA card has a couple of benefits. First of all, it came out this year. The 6800 XT, some of you may have forgotten because they weren't available for a while because of pandemic and everything else. This came out in 2020. It is almost three years old at this point. Now that doesn't make it bad in any way, shape or form, but it is in fact the previous generation card. We have its sort of replacement on the top. We, the 79, we'll get to that in a minute. The 4070 has much faster ray tracing cores. If you are interested in games with ray tracing, there's Nvidia, and there's NVIDIA, and everybody else, which is basically AMD and Intel, are second place. It has DLSS both two and three. I know some of you are not a fan of frame generation, but the fact of the matter is, if you want 100, 200 frames per second games, you're not gonna get it through pure rasterization. You need that DLSS frame generation to get those really high frame rates, even with this beast, but we'll get to that in a minute. It also has the NVENC encoder, which not everybody cares about, but if you like video encoding, if you stream while encoding your games, if you record gameplay, that does make a difference to some people. There are some other technologies, tensor cores and whatnot for AI work that are also on NVIDIA cards that simply aren't on AMD. 
the technology is more advanced despite the fact that people go, well, it doesn't have enough VRAM. I agree with you. It should have 16 gigs of VRAM. For 600 bucks, it really should have, or it should have been, it should have, been cheaper. But we can't change that. We have to buy what exists on the market. It is absolutely okay to put an RX 6800 XT or RX 6950 XT, which I don't have a box for, but those are about $100 more expensive, and they're about 10 to 15% faster than a 4070. You can find those for about $600, at least while supplies last. Do not expect the 6000 series cards to stay in stock much longer. They are dwindling in supply. Or you can bypass this entire argument and buy what I currently think is the best deal on a premium high-end video card for a new machine to last you for more than two years. And that is not the 4090. Rather, it is the AMD RX 7900 XT. Not the XTX, the XTX costs too much at $1,000. This card has recently been available for $750. I actually tweeted that deal the other day. If you want great deals on computer parts, be sure to follow me over on Twitter, link in the video description below. $750, no mail-in rebate required, and that was for a Sapphire card, a very nice card. Sapphire makes excellent cards. 20 gigabytes of VRAM, folks, only $120 more than this thing. For $120 bucks more, an RX 7900 XT absolutely demolishes a 4070 in terms of performance. In gaming, maybe not in games with DLSS 3, but it would take DLSS 3 to close the gap. DLSS 2 won't do it. In gaming, this thing is an absolute beast. 12 gigs of VRAM, 20 gigs of VRAM. At the moment, $130-ish, $125 difference in price. To me, this is a no-brainer. Unless you need NVIDIA features, the 7900 XT is an amazing value for the money. And I think not enough attention is being paid to it just because, I guess, AMD just doesn't get the love. But I love this card right now. Now, if you don't like the 4070, but you do like NVIDIA features and you're wary about AMD drivers, to be clear... I've had no problems. We've used this in a bunch of different games. We've put it into several computers. We've had no problems, but I get it. 4090. Skip the 4070 Ti. Skip the 4080. Neither one of them make any sense. The 4070 Ti is 200 bucks more, and while it's faster, it has 12 gigs of VRAM. $800 for a 12 gigabyte V. No, no, just no, absolutely not. $1,200 for the 4080 when this thing beats it in some games for $750. Uh, how about no? Now, to be fair, $1,600 for the 4090 is a freaking lot of money. And I understand that. That is, that is in a league of its own. Now, it's in a league of its own for, for performance. The 4090 is faster than the 7900 XT and 7900 XTX and everything. I mean, it's just absolutely in a league of its own. And it well should be for, for $1,600. It does have 24 gigs of VRAM. It does have all the NVIDIA features. It is the fastest graphics card you could buy. But if you've got 4090 money, should you really be building a Ryzen 7 7700X? I think not. Now, I'm not a fan of the 7800X 3D, but if you've got 4090 money, you should at least be buying the 7800X 3D. That, this deserves it. What you really should be buying is an i9-13900K because you're just going to be in the position of buying an awesome chip every few years if you've got this kind of money. I really don't think this is what most of you should buy. I actually think the 7900 XT is what you should buy. Now, you can go down from here as well and save some money and wait for some new cards to come out as well. I do want to give a big honorable mention to the 6000 series card that is below this, the RX 6700 XT. Now, it has 12 gigs of VRAM, but as, the t as of the date of this filming, you can buy one for $310, half the price of the 4070. Now, it's not as fast as the 4070, not by a long shot, but it is not half the performance. You lose maybe 30-ish percent of the performance for half the money. The true deal in the market is the 6700 XT, but again, you're building a next-gen system, buy a next-gen card. Before we talk about the system RAM, if you're gonna buy yourself an absolutely awesome deal of a video card, such as the $750 RX 7900 XT, you're gonna need a nice comfortable chair to sit in as well. Now, some of you have some cheap $59 office chair from Office Depot or Office Max or whatnot. Dear Lord, why? Ewin, I'm gonna show you the sponsor spot for Ewin here in just a second. However, 
we have been sitting in these chairs for over five years. I've sat in these chairs for over 10 hours. What you're about to watch is not just a sponsored spot. It is genuinely how I feel about these things. They are very comfortable. They hold up very well. This chair that I'm sitting in right now is the one that we used to live stream in for up to eight hours at a time. It is still comfortable. It still works. All the functions work. The material and the fabric are not messed up in any way. We have received offers from other sponsor spots, which we have turned down because frankly, we like these chairs and I only want to promote stuff that I personally am happy to sit in. So please give me 60 seconds to help pay for this video and I'll be back with the Ram in just a second. Today's video is brought to you by Ewin Racing, the best source for gaming chairs and desks for those long gaming sessions. We have a playlist of our Ewin chair and desk videos linked in the video description below. Save 30% off of everything using the discount code TECHDEALS. More details at the end of the video. Next, we're going to talk about System RAM. System RAM is actually a very easy conversation to have on this particular build video series. 32 gigabytes. 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes. If you are just gaming, 32 gigabytes is all you need in 2023. There are no games on the market that will show any difference whatsoever if you are just gaming. Unless you're multitasking, live streaming, you have multiple monitors, you're watching YouTube videos, listening to music, and doing other things with your computer while you game, in which case I would get 64. 128 gigabytes of RAM is reserved for content creators, YouTubers, and really high-end users if you run virtual machines and a lot of other complicated things that really don't fall within the preview of a Ryzen 7 7700X. If you're doing that kind of stuff, you should be on an i9 or Ryzen 9. Now, as far as RAM speed goes, Zen 4 prefers DDR5-6000. The cast latency can vary a little bit between 30 and 40, depending on the type of RAM you have, but 6000 is the sweet spot. Do not bother going higher. It breaks the infinity fabric. There are some tweaks you can do to try to squeeze past 6,000. Please, do, do, just stick with an AMD spec. AMD's designed it for 6,000, use 6,000. However, you can also use 5,600. What's the performance difference? Nothing you'd notice outside of a benchmark. I have trivial differences. This here is 32 gigabytes of DDR5 5,600, and this has recently been available for $80. There is nothing wrong with this RAM kit right here. It will provide you great performance and be just fine. Especially if you plan to upgrade your CPU in a couple years, maybe Zen 5, maybe you can skip Zen 5, you'll just wait for Zen 6 and you'll upgrade then. You're gonna want faster RAM at that point. You may want more RAM at that point. So buy a less expensive kit and just live with it for a little bit and then you can buy something fancier and faster later when the prices come down. Or you could just jump straight to the end of the line and say, okay, I'm going to get myself 32 or 64 gigs of Trident Z5 RGB Neo AMD Expo certified RAM. Does the AMD Expo certification actually matter? Yes. I have tested a bunch of different RAM kits on several different AMD boards. Even on the launch BIOSes, way back when it first came out, I was able to put two separate RAM kits onto an X670E motherboard and run it at DDR5 6000 CL30 with four DIMMs installed, which a lot of people say, oh yeah, but you can't install four of those. Yes, you can by using two identical Trident Z5 Neo Expo certified kit. Man, that is a mouthful, is it not? It is important to note, not all DDR5 is the same. I have here a pair of those exact kits. Intel XMP Ready, AMD Expo certified. The DDR5 kits are actually different. If you're building an Intel system, buy the Intel XMP Ready RAM. If you're building an AMD system, make sure you buy the Expo certified RAM. These are physically different RAM kits with different built-in timings. Yes, maybe you can put the Intel kit on AMD and it might work, or you might have to tweak the timings by hand. And yes, you can put the AMD kit on Intel and it might work if you tweak the timings. Why in the world would you wanna give yourself that kind of headache? Buy the right RAM kit for your system. For those few of you who might be building both an Intel and an AMD based system using DDR5, allow me to introduce you to Viper Venom DDR5 RAM. This actually contains both Intel XMP and AMD Expo certifications. 
It probably has two different profiles on the SPD or Serial Presence Detect on the RAM. So when you go into your BIOS, what you need to do is select, do you want the XMP profile or do you want the Expo profile? Make sure you select the correct one for your system. No computer is gonna boot without a boot drive. And in this case, of course, it's gonna be a solid state drive. You can see I have a wide variety of SSDs here. Most of these aren't new. I recently did a whole series of the history of SSDs. That should be linked down in the video description below if you'd like to see it. I had an entire desk full of SSDs dating back 10 years and much newer ones talking about the pros and cons of various drives. Here, we're strictly looking at the sort of drives that would be appropriate for a Ryzen 7 7700X or similar type system. Now, the boot drive that I put into this system was the Samsung 980 Pro 2 terabyte drive. It is not actually the newest drive from Samsung, that would be the 990 Pro. The differences between these are only gonna show up in benchmarks, it doesn't really matter. But if it makes you feel better, for about $30 or the cost of a couple of pizzas, you can buy the 990 Pro instead. The 970 Pro and the 970 Evo are Gen 3 drives and Gen 3 doesn't make any sense for the boot drive for a system like this. If you don't like Samsung for whatever reason or perhaps wherever you live, there's a deal and you could buy something else, the Western Digital SN850X is just as fast as the 980 Pro. It is a wonderful drive, great performance, absolutely recommend 1010 would buy again. Another option to consider, and actually faster than the 980 Pro, is the SK Hynix P41 Platinum. I actually have this drive in the i9-13900K build I did recently, which you haven't seen yet, but you will soon. This may very well be the fastest drive on the market today, even a little bit faster than the 990 Pro. SK Hynix is one of the primary memory manufacturers. They actually make the NAND on a lot of these drives. Samsung, Micron, and SK Hynix. So it's a legit drive, even if you're not personally familiar with the name SK Hynix. Now for your boot drive, those are the four choices I would pick from. There's nothing else on the market that I personally would buy. Yes, you can save 10 or $20 by buying something cheaper. You're building a premium next gen system. You're building something that's gonna last you for five plus years. Don't waste your time with a Gen 3. Don't waste your time with some ultra budget drive, DRAMless drive, QLC drive. These are the sort of drives that are appropriate for a Zen 4 based or Raptor Lake based system. Now I did pick out a two terabyte boot drive. Some people disagree with that stance. I stand firm on it. You want this to last five plus years. Files are getting bigger. Windows will get bigger. Updates, everything else gets downloaded. Your boot drive just creeps in size over time. Changing your boot drive is a big fat pain in the neck. I think two terabytes is appropriate given where prices are today. But if you disagree with me, you absolutely can go with a one terabyte drive if you prefer. Now I did not include a secondary or game drive in the budget of that build, but of course I understand many of you will put one in. There are a lot of choices for a game drive and a gen three drive would be absolutely fine for a game drive even on a next gen system. If you're launching most games from Steam or one of the other game launchers, you're not really gonna notice a big difference between a good gen three and a good gen four drive. And I say good gen three because there's good gen threes and there's not so good gen threes. A good example of a budget good gen three is this MP34 from Team Group. This is a four terabyte gen three TLC SLC cached DRAM buffer drive with 3.5 gigabyte per second reads and three gigabyte per second writes, and it really sustains it. It's very similar in performance to Samsung's previous generation 970 Evo Plus. Great drive. At the time I'm filming, $185 for four terabytes of NVMe. Performance NVMe, a bit Gen 3. Great drive, I love it. I actually have two of these. I've got one in the system. This will go into another. You can also go SATA. There's nothing wrong with going SATA if you're on a budget or maybe you use the Team Group MP34 for your secondary game drive and you have a tertiary or third drive using the non-fancy word. This, this is very cheap. It is cheaply built. It is not that fast, but it is an SSD and it is four terabytes and it is $150. This is a two and a half inch SATA drive from Levin. It's a very cheap manufacturer. This is QLC NAND. There's no DRAM buffer. It is it is what it is, but it's much better than a hard drive. So we'll leave it there. But if you need to add another drive, or maybe you don't have another M.2 slot on your motherboard, that would be an option for expanding storage as well. One more thing to consider when picking SSDs, especially NVMEs in 2023 and beyond. 
This is a Silicon Power XS70. I actually really like this drive. This is a premium Gen 4 drive at a great price. $268 at the time of filming, four terabytes, over seven gigabytes per second on the read, 6.8 gigabytes per second on the write. This is designed for a PlayStation 5. In fact, the heatsink is perfectly sized to fit straight into a PlayStation 5 and provide great performance. Here's the problem. That heatsink is glued on and it's essentially non-removable. You can with a heat gun and tools and prying and a lot of patience. I know because I've done it. I would not recommend you do it. The problem is most modern motherboards these days have big flat heat sinks covering all the M.2 slots and these kind of drives will not fit. So drives with built-in heat sinks can obstruct the ability for you to put the plate back on your motherboard. So I kind of would shy away from these things. But if you have a PS5 and you want to add four terabytes of storage, holy smokes, $268, that is a deal. And it's a great drive. It's just a big heat sink. The astute among you will notice this Acer Predator SSD on the desk. This is still new in box. I have not tested it yet. So I'm reluctant to recommend something I have not personally tested. I've used everything else on the desk. This drive is a Gen 4 premium drive with high-end performance. Acer Predator makes SSDs now? No, they don't. This is probably one of the third-party manufactured drives out of China that they slapped their label on and put into a box. Is it fine? The specs say it should be. If you find a really good deal on it, you might want to consider picking it up. It's just as of the recording of this video, I have not personally tested it yet, so I can't give it my seal of approval. Before we hop into our next section, which will be CPU coolers, please give me just one more minute to tell you a little bit more detail about our first sponsor in this video, URCD Keys, and I'll be back in just a minute. Looking for a Windows 10 or 11 product key, but you don't want to spend $100 to $200 for it? Our sponsor, URCD Keys, provides discounted Windows keys at amazing prices. $15 for Windows 10 Professional, $21 for Windows 11 Professional, and just $60 for Microsoft Office 2021 Professional Plus. These product keys are the real deal. They activate directly with Microsoft Online, link to your Microsoft account, and they work forever. For Windows, you simply go to Settings, Update and Security, Activation, click Change Product Key, paste the key provided by URCD Keys, and in seconds, you're activated with Microsoft. For Office, go to setup.office.com, sign in with your Microsoft account, paste the product key provided by URCD Keys, and then download Office 2021 Pro Plus directly from Microsoft. Remember to use the discount code TD20 to save 25% off the already deeply discounted prices and support our channel at the same time. We have been using product keys from URCD Keys for almost five years now without any issues and encourage you to do so as well. We need a cooler to keep our CPU nice and cool for those long gaming sessions. And unlike in years past when a four heat pipe direct contact cooler such as the excellent Hyper 212 Evo would have done the job, its day has largely passed, at least for this level of build. That's actually still a perfectly fine cooler for lower end systems. But if you're building a Ryzen 7 7700X or a i5-13600K, you need more than that. I recommended the Scythe Mugen 5 in my original parts overview for this video. This is a six heat pipe direct contact cooler with 50% more cooling than something like a Hyper 212 Evo. I have multiple copies of this cooler. I have installed it on multiple machines. It does a wonderful, wonderful job. Now, this is not an appropriate cooler for an i9 or a Ryzen 9. This is an i5 or a Ryzen 7 level cooler. You need to step it up if you want to upgrade in the future. And I did mention that in the first video. I have two extremely good Noctua coolers over here. And if you don't mind paying a premium price, they're worth every penny they cost. They're just not cheap you're looking at about $120. They both have the same cooling capacity, believe it or not, even though the one on the top is much smaller. And that's because it has a tighter fin stack and a different fan design, and it's technically a more advanced cooler, but both of these provide about the same cooling performance. I use these on my test benches. Both my i9-13900K test bench and my Ryzen 9 7950X test bench are both cooled by Noctua and HD15s, if you've seen our benchmarks, there are no temperature issues. 
I used the smaller NHU-12A on our previous generation test bench, the Zen 3, the X570, and a Ryzen 9 5950X has no problems running at full load for any amount of time using that cooler. They are not inexpensive, but they are very well made. The mounting systems are excellent. There's no sharp edges to cut your fingers, and they're Chromax black. However, some of you like liquid cooling. Now, I don't personally believe liquid cooling is necessary, not even for an i9-13900K. Even in stress testing, the Noctua NHD15 did just fine. However, for aesthetics, airflow within the case, RGB, or just personal preference, or maybe you like to overclock, we're testing at stock, you could get something like this IQ H150i Elite CapEx. That's a mouthful from Corsair. They've actually replaced this. I believe this is the previous generation model. Now it's the CapEx EX or XT, I forget which. Regardless, this is a 360 millimeter liquid cooler. Most of the 360 millimeter liquid coolers on the market are identical and they're all made by one company with different fans and different other things added to them by the various manufacturers. Corsair does not manufacture liquid coolers. Neither do most of the companies on the market. There's a few exceptions, but most companies do not. Most 360 liquid coolers will perform give or take about the same. Now the fan noise might be different. The RGB will look different. The connection and mounting system will be different. And you do wanna make sure that any cooler you buy, be it liquid or tower, works with AM5. Now it is true that the mounting holes did not change between AM4 and AM5. And if you have an AM4 cooler, you might say, well, can't I just keep my existing cooler? Maybe. Here's the trick. On AM4 motherboards, the back plate was removable. So when you undid the top screws, the plate would come off the board and you just have four holes on the motherboard like Intel does on their consumer level boards. On AM5, AMD changed that. The back plate is permanently fixed and the screw holes are permanently on the board. If you have a cooler which uses the original AMD backplate, it will be compatible with AM5. If you have an AM4 cooler which told you to remove the AMD backplate and use their supplied backplate instead, it will not be compatible with AM5, at least not without an adapter kit. Very important detail that gets kind of lost in the press and publicity of, yeah, it's compatible, we didn't move the screw mountings, it's wonderful. And of course, if you go with Intel, you'll need LGA 1700 because they did move the screw holes for some strange reason. One observation I would like to make about liquid coolers is size. You can go bigger and you can go smaller than 360 millimeters, or at least if you go bigger, you're going to 140 millimeter fans. I installed a H170 version of this on our i9-13900K, which is a whopping 420 millimeter liquid cooler. That is three 140 millimeter fans installed on the roof of our Corsair 7000D case. It's overkill, but I can have those fans turning at minimum speed and it still runs fine. I did it mostly for the noise component rather than the cooling component because with that much cooling, I don't have to turn the fans very fast. In order to cool a 13900K at full load, the fan on this NHD15, it's turning pretty quickly and it is not silent. So that is one benefit of liquid cooling noise, not cooling power. You can go smaller than a 360. There's two intermediate sizes, a 240 and a 280. The 240 is two 120 millimeter fans. The 280 is two 140 millimeter fans. I can tell you from personal experience because I've built with both, the 280s are noticeably quieter than the 240s. The fans can turn slower, thus making less noise. So if you care about noise, the 280s make more sense. And the 280s have 36% more thin surface area versus the 240s. But 280s aren't as common, and mounting points for 280s aren't as common as 240s and 360s. I can tell you that the 240s are struggling with these new high-end CPUs. You could put it on the 7700X or the i5-13600K. I would absolutely not, under any circumstances, put a 240 millimeter liquid cooler on a Ryzen 9 or an i9, which means if you go with such a cooler now, just like this, Scythe Mugen 5 here, you are limiting your future upgrade options, which is why if you think you will do a future upgrade, go ahead and buy a better cooler from day one. You really can't build a computer without a motherboard. And here on the desk, I have a selection of three very different motherboard choices. We have a B650E, 
a very premium B650. We have the board originally in the build guide, which is the X670E Steel Legend from ASRock, $285, very good value. And then we have an absolutely ridiculous X670E MSI Meg Ace. Yeah, that's actually its name. $700, holy smokes. No, most of you don't need this. This is absolute overkill. It is an extremely niche product. This is where the value is in terms of X670. Now, in the original video, many of you left comments beneath that video saying, come on, you don't need to spend $285 for a motherboard for a system like this. A $150 or $170 B650 motherboard, not this, a much more basic board, would be just fine. Yes, it would be for today, for that specific build. However, if you plan to upgrade to Zen 5 and possibly Zen 6, you may very well regret that choice down the road. How many owners of cheap, inexpensive B350 and B450 motherboards did that because, hey, a Ryzen 5 1600 or a Ryzen 5 2600 doesn't need more than this. Why would you spend more on a motherboard? And then they wanted to go drop in a faster CPU. I got a comment the other day from somebody who had one of those El Cheapo motherboards, and then he said he installed a Ryzen 7 5800X 3D and ran into all kinds of problems. He started to get stability issues. He got overtemping issues. The system would randomly shut down. And he's like, well, this is simply unstable. I said, it's quite possibly your VRMs. He had a motherboard with no heat sinks on the VRMs at all. It was like one of those $70 cheap motherboards. And so he installed a high-powered, high-powered draw, high-temperature CPU on a motherboard with no VRM cooling and a very limited power delivery. I believe it was a 4 plus 1 or 4 plus 2 phase, extremely basic motherboard. I have no problem with budget motherboards in the right circumstance. If you're putting together an i5-12400F system, those are about $150, or you're building a previous generation AM4 budget system based on a Ryzen 5 5500 or Ryzen 5 5600, sure, absolutely, a $100 motherboard, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, makes total sense. But the whole purpose of this Ryzen 7 7700X build is the future. If you are not building for the future, why are you building this at all? You really should be building an i5-13600K, a one and done system where it's one CPU and one motherboard and you're never gonna upgrade it, which is the case with Intel. Yeah, $170, $180 motherboard, you can get some Z boards in that price points that are just fine for an i5-based system. I don't have any problem with that. The purpose of this board is to give you a little bit of future proofing and some better features. There are X670 boards close to $200, but they lose a lot of features to get there. They lose M.2 slots. They lose audio support. The audio chip on board goes down. They lose VRMs. The power delivery is reduced. They lose USB ports. You're losing features for a relatively small percentage of the price of your system, and you cannot just pay 50 bucks three years from now and glue that extra stuff on. And if you have to change the motherboard in your system, you basically are building a new computer. You have to undo the CPU power connectors, the ATX power connector, unplug your headers, USB connectors, take out your graphics card, storage, RAM, everything. Then put in the new motherboard and pray all the plugs are in the same place and all your nice wiring and cabling all matches. In reality, what you're really doing is you're just completely upgrading your system, at which point you might as well be completely upgrading your system. I personally believe that a motherboard change is a new computer. And if you do upgrade to a new chipset in the future, potentially you also want to do a reinstall of Windows and then you're really going down a rabbit hole. Yes, I know it's a first gen board and I know some people say, yeah, but the features will get better in the future. Very important point to everybody who says that. First, I understand your point. The first generation AM4 boards really did kind of suck. All of them, even the higher end boards. Although with later BIOS fixes, the nicer X370 boards did finally get pretty good. The other point is AMD was nearly bankrupt in 2017. The motherboard manufacturers did not believe in them. Many of the companies only released like two X370 boards and two B350 boards. Today, I think Gigabyte has like 40 AM5 boards they launched with Zen 4. That's a far cry from like four. The difference in the market, AMD today is a leader. AMD is really doing well. They've got double digit percentages. I think they're over 20% of the CPU market today. 
So the motherboard manufacturers have put real time and money into developing these boards, whereas when Ryzen first launched, there was a lot of questions as to whether AMD would even be in business. So the circumstances around the launch of those boards is not the same as the circumstances around the launch of these boards. I think you can buy a premium board like this for $285, which, yes, I agree, is too much board for just a Ryzen 7 7700X. But if you're just doing a 7700X, you shouldn't be building this computer at all. That's what Intel's for. But if you plan to put a Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9 three or four years from now, I personally believe you'll be really grateful you spent the extra money on a nice board. It is awfully difficult to turn on your new computer if you don't put a power supply in it. I recommended in the original build video this EVGA Supernova 1000 watt GT power supply, $165, again at the time of filming. EVGA makes a lot of power supplies and I have used most of them. You see two more here, I've got a whole shelf of them over there. I thought about filling the entire desk with EVGA power supplies, but I thought that might be a bit much. I've done that in a previous video. They also make a G2, a G3, a G5, a G6, and a G7. In fact, there was actually a G7 box on the beginning of the first video. They're all a little bit different. They all use slightly different internal components, and some of them are actually made by different contract manufacturers. Fun fact, EVGA doesn't build power supplies. In fact, almost nobody actually builds power supplies. There's like three main power supply companies in the world that make everybody's power supplies. Seasonic, Superflower, and one other I can't remember off the top of my head. But regardless, I recommended a thousand watt power supply. And just like the motherboards in the last video, several people said, you don't need a thousand watt power supply for this. To which I would say, you are absolutely correct. A 1000 watt power supply for an RTX 4070 and a Ryzen 7 7700X is way overkill. A 750 watt power supply is fine, and you can easily save yourself $50 by going down to a 750 watt power supply. Whether it's this Aorus or whether it's an EVGA or another manufacturer, it really doesn't matter so long as it's from a quality well-known brand. That being said, the entire theme of this build is upgrades, 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 upgrades. You don't know what the power draw is going to be on the 50 series. On the 60 series, maybe you go AMD. The RX 7900 XT draws more power than an RTX 4070 by a decent margin. This type of computer will easily get at least one, but quite possibly two graphics card upgrades over the next five, six, possibly seven years. We don't know how long it's going to last. Do you want to have to worry about having to change out your power supply? For an extra $50, and at the time of recording, an EVGA 750 watt 80 plus gold power supply was about $115. $50 less than the thousand. So for $50, you're basically set. You don't have to worry about it. There is another benefit to having a large power supply besides just do you have enough power to run? And that is power supply efficiency curve. Electricity rates have been rising. Some of you pay a lot more than we do. We're in Texas. We get relatively inexpensive power. But I know on the coasts and I know overseas, your power rates tend to be higher. Power supplies are most efficient when they run in the middle of their power band. The bottom 20% and the top 20% are noticeably less efficient and are outside the efficiency ratings. You only get that gold or titanium or platinum efficiency rating when you're within that middle 60% band. If you want your power supply to last 10, 15 years through a complete system upgrade, you can take this with you beyond AM5, take it to AM6, keep this thing 10 plus years. But if you want it to last a long time and be reliable, you don't want to be pulling 80 to 90% of its power capacity. You want to be pulling 60% of its power capacity. And so while your computer may only need five or 600 watts, a thousand watt power supply will essentially last forever. Not really, but it will last far longer than you'll need it for your computer and you'll be ready to upgrade to something else. A 750 watt power supply is gonna be more in that 80 to 85% band, whereas this is gonna be like at 60. There's something to be said for that and a power supply is not a component you want to fail. It can take a lot of your other expensive parts with it. Now you will notice I have two other power supplies on the desk. These are older bronze model units, but they are not the same grade unit. This 600B here is a relatively inexpensive power supply. I think this was originally like $45 or something. 
If you have a computer that you're upgrading and you wanna keep your power supply and you have something like a 600 watt power supply and it's this grade power supply where it's not their supernova line, it's not a more premium model, replace it. These were fine for the day. I would not, even though, to be fair, 600 watts would run a Ryzen 7 7700X and an RTX 4070. 650 is technically the recommendation. I could tell you from having, we have a kilowatt meter on the wall. This would absolutely run that. But it isn't the type of power supply that I would put such a very nice computer on. On the other hand, if I had the one on the bottom, this 850 watt supernova power supply, this is a fully modular power supply. It comes in a much larger box. It's actually physically a larger unit. The cables are modular. It is, it is a premium grade step up over the cheaper one. So it does matter what quality power supply you have. If I had this 850 watt supernova, supernova is basically their nicer power supplies. If it doesn't say supernova, it's EVGA's lower brand. This is an EVGA branding thing. But if you had one of these, sure. I, you could keep this. There's nothing wrong with this. This would absolutely run that. And it's premium enough that even though it's bronze, that's an efficiency rating, not a quality rating. I would put a 7700X and a 4070 on this. I would not put an i9 or a Ryzen 9 on this. I would not put a 4090 on this or a 7900XT. If you're going to that step, yeah, just go ahead and spend the $165. Get yourself a brand new power supply. Get yourself better efficiency rating. Gold's kind of where it's at these days anyway. One more thing. Many people sometimes accuse me of just recommending the best. Come on, tech, you're always telling people just buy the best, overspend, be ready for any possible upgrade. That costs a fortune. We're not all made of money. I understand. I have on the desk the made of money power supply. This is a 1300 watt platinum EVGA. These things are over $300. I am not recommending any of you buy this. If you are remotely inclined to buy a power supply that is over $300, you should be building an Uber machine right now. We're talking RTX 4090, i9, 13900K, and even then it's kind of overkill to be completely honest with you. Generally, you're gonna be pulling max about 200 watts out of the 13900K. Max, you're gonna be pulling 400-ish watts. Yes, it can go higher than that, but in our testing, in actual games, we typically don't see much more than 400 watts. So that's about 600 watts. Okay, 100 watts for everything else. Motherboard, RAM, SSDs, and everything else you could put in there. So you're looking at maybe 700-ish watts out of that system. But that's it. Full load. And it is worth noting that you rarely do full load on both the CPU and the GPU at the same time. Usually it's one or the other. Because if your graphics card bottlenecked, your CPU is not fully loaded. And if your CPU bottlenecked, your graphics card is not fully loaded. So if you're gaming... Even that scenario is extremely rare. Now, we're not talking about content creation or workstation use. That could be a little bit different, but generally you're only using one or the other. This is kind of expensive overkill. There's nothing wrong with it. These are amazing. This thing is an absolute beast. However, it's 300 plus dollars. Skip this. $165 is much more reasonable. I am a fan of spending a little bit more to get a little bit of future proofing and a little bit of premium and a little bit of margin for error, but I am not a fan of just going crazy and spending way more than is necessary. I'm willing to bet most of you don't wanna just put your computer parts together on the desk and just hope for the best. You need a case. And in that case, pun intended, you need a computer case. The original build had the $99 Cooler Master H500 ARGB case you can see right here. It is not the fanciest or nicest case they make, but at $99, it is a really good value for the money. If you want more room, more expandability, better airflow, the Corsair 5000D sitting on my right here in white, it's also available in black, has better airflow than this does, despite the wonderful fans in the front, but it has ventilations on the side, ventilations in the front, ventilation on the top, and ventilation in the back. There's also an X version of this case, which has glass in the front and RGB fans, in which case you would mount your cooler here on the side and get airflow through the sides. It's actually a pretty clever design. It's also twice the price. These are close to $200 versus $99. That's a personal choice. When you look at cases, do you want something small and portable or big and massive? Do you want tons of future upgradability, place to put hard drives, SSDs, any size video card you could possibly want, lots of cooling, custom cooling. 
you'll need a bigger case for all of that. If you're willing to sacrifice all of that and go smaller, you won't be able to put a full loop custom cooler into your case, which of course you shouldn't be doing in a $99 case anyway. That deserves a much nicer case, but you could certainly go all the way down to ITX. I'm not a huge fan of ITX cases for modern builds. I think there's so many compromises and they cost more. Smaller ITX motherboards with fewer features actually cost more than the large motherboards, but that's personal preference. If you wanna do it, go for it. I just encourage you to do one step before you buy any parts. Make a list of everything you wanna put in the computer. All the SSDs, the two and a half inch drives, the three and a half inch hard drives, what graphics card do you wanna put in? What graphics card do you want to be able to put in the future? If you think you might upgrade to a bigger card in the future, look at the length and width of the cards you might be interested in, and then look at the dimensions available in the case that you're shopping for and make sure you have room to put that even if you don't buy it on day one. Motherboard configuration. Where are the eight pin CPU power connectors going? Is there a place at the top of the case to route them? I've used way too many cheap $59 cases that do not have a good place to put those cables and you end up running them on front of the board or around the graphics card and it's just absolutely terrible. Cable management. So have a good long look at all of the pictures and preferably videos of any case you're interested in and think to yourself before you buy anything, where are the cables going? Where's the main board going? Where's the CPU power connectors going? Where are the USB headers? Are they convenient for the case? Does the case have the right USB headers for the front panel connectors for whatever motherboard that you're purchasing? It is very easy to overlook those decisions in the process of putting together a build. I've been guilty of that at least once. And so I would suggest you spend some time on that part of the build before you buy anything so that you know exactly what you're getting into and you don't have a surprise on build day. Before we get to my final thoughts on this build, I just wanna give one more shout out to Ewin. I've been sitting here now for several hours putting this video together and I'll be sitting in this chair many more hours editing it along with my wife who will do some of the editing as well. Give me another 60 seconds. Let me tell you a little bit more details about Ewin and I'll be back with my final thoughts in just a minute. Ewin Racing has a wide selection of chairs to fit all shapes and sizes of gamers ranging from petite to cuddly. They have something for every type of gamer, not just sizes, but colors and material options as well, including red, blue, purple, pink, orange, and more plus cloth and leather choices. We have over half a dozen chair and desk videos in a playlist down in the video description below. We also have a very special offer just for tech deals viewers save 30% off of everything using discount code tech deals using our link in the video description. We have used Ewin gaming chairs for three years in our office, sitting on them for up to eight hour marathon live streams. They are very comfortable and we are happy to work with Ewin to bring you this special discount and recommend Ewin for all of your gaming chair and desk needs. Thank you all so much for staying with me to my final thoughts. Two gold stars to all of you still here. This is an interesting build because some people have very strong feelings about some of the components that I chose, but hopefully in this long why vlog, I explained why they're here. It is 100% okay if some of you disagree with me. Cheaper motherboard, cheaper power supply. Hey, it is your build. It is your money. You can do it absolutely any way you want. That is totally fine. I'm just explaining why this is here because we were given the gift of AM4 upgradability. Now we've been given AM5 and my expectation is we should get at least three generations, Zen 4, Zen 5, and Zen 6. Who knows, maybe AMD will surprise us and give us Zen 7 and this thing will last a very long time. Only time will tell. Regardless, the point of this platform is that future upgradability and that all the parts go along with it. I fully expect this graphics card to have to get upgraded. The RTX 4070 is in some ways the weak component in this build. And if you wanna wait for the next generation of graphics cards, you could even go down a little bit, as I mentioned before. RX 6700 XT would definitely be a weak component of the build, but it'd be just fine for a lot of current games. Intel, i5-13600K is absolutely the best value on the market today, but there's just no upgrade path. So are you okay with that? That's a personal choice. Should you go up or down on the CPU? That is a very good question and I will give you the answer in two years once we know all the facts about Zen 5 and how well these things age. 
Overall, I hope this was informative and educational. I look forward to your comments down in the comment section below. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me on Twitter or you can reach out on Patreon, link down in the video description below. I may or may not answer everybody on Twitter, but I do promise I'll respond to all of our members over on Patreon. You can join for just $2 a month and get a variety of benefits over there. Thank you again for watching this video. I will see all of you next time.